I, I'd like to get going now, and thank you all for coming. I'm Professor Gray. I'll be introducing our guest today, uh, uh, Tom Folders, the principal of Beige Design, visiting from Berkeley, California. Uh, in addition to uh, 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 private practice, Professor Folders is a professor at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco. Uh, and. Uh, uh, runs an innovative practice uh, with an eye towards a diverse range of newly developing technologies, uh, innovative products that allow for individual customization to the organization of uh, complex networks. His studio seeks to foreground the role of architecture as a materially and spatially responsive environment. Uh, Professor Folders has had his uh, work uh, published and, and widely recognized in uh, such periodicals as Architectural Record, uh, Architecture, Culture, uh, and Axis, uh, Metropolis, New York Times, uh, Wired, and uh, World Architecture. Uh, he's lectured uh, around the country and around the world, and I hope you all would uh, uh, join me in uh, extending our uh, warmest welcome to uh, uh, Professor Tom Folders. I'm sorry. Before before I hand the uh, the stage over, you, you need to get wired in, right? Or, uh, uh, I, I'm to announce that our reception today is going to take place uh, uh, down by Ceres, where our uh, one of our travel groups that went through uh, uh, Germany and, and parts of uh, uh, Russia is uh, uh, putting an installation piece up, and uh, uh, we'll be having a celebration down there after the lecture, I believe. With uh, I, I've been told that there's going to be ice cream, so there you go. All right, thanks very much. He teaches us at CCA, and we miss him dearly. Uh, Tim has told me. Um, a lot about a number of the projects that he's been involved with, um, with you and the school here. It's incredible work, um, and you're quite fortunate to, to have him here on your, your faculty. Uh, this, I, I like this bubble. There's always firsts in life. It's great. This is a first. Um, this double slide, double projection. Um, and I think we can. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm just going to jump right in here. Uh, this is a smoke ring that was blown by an artist uh, named Frank Stella. Many of you probably know him. Know of him, I should say. He was a painter, then later on went on to become a sculptor. And uh, later in life, he's still living, uh, started to get involved with architecture. In the late 80s, he was relaxing after a busy day working in his studio, um, puffing on his cigars, loving smoke rings, one of which you see right here, and uh, was captivated with the fact that this thing was, was basically merging and emerging in real time, the smoke ring, just kind of transforming in space. And uh, for him, it was a bit of a eureka moment. Um, this this thing, this non-living thing, that seemed to be imbued or embedded with life. And it's something that he was uh, quite interested in, in achieving more life in his art. And it's something that resonates with me um, uh, thinking about architecture. What does this mean, trying to find something that has more life about it? Um, he went on to, uh, a number of years later, work with some assistants, and they set up this large black booth uh, his, where's my power? There we go. These are his lips right here. This are the residual of his lips, and this is the smoke ring that he's blowing. So he set up this black booth with light bulbs, had a bunch of cameras like these over here. Uh, he'd blow these smoke rings, and they'd be basically uh, freeze framed and essentially digitized, scanned, and, and turned into drawings. And they would stop there as drawings. They were isolated. And my interest, really, uh, with the work that we do, uh, would go back to the transient nature of the smoke ring itself. 
And uh, something that has this ongoing difference, okay, it's constantly changing. It's anomalous in the sense that, that it's, it's out of control. One doesn't necessarily know what form it will take. Uh, but it is forming, from form to formation, this act of, of changing in time. Now, why is this particularly of interest at this point in time? In the digital environment, this is certainly something that, that many of us are used to working with, right? This ongoing transitional nature of, of working with our design models, right? Over time, through animations, or through sequencing or versioning, these kind of quick action ways of, of designing. And it's all very interesting, good stuff. However, uh, the question that I've been involved with, with my studio and, and with my teaching, <coughs> my studio practice and my teaching, would be to ask, is it possible to continue these types of anomalies beyond the digital modeling phase, beyond um, our, our um, point of design in the project, can it start to pop off the screen, as it were, into the built element itself? Right. Play this again. Now these are some animations that we were doing, and I want to stop right there. And this is a perfect example of the anomaly or emergence. This is something that, that uh, you hear a lot about today, this idea of emergence, right? um, where more is different. You get a bunch of something together, and uh, you play it out. Basically, one has to go through the processes of, of emergence uh, to have something else take place. And in this case, in this drawing, uh, this animation, we, si we si simply set up a polar grid of, of little rectangles. And uh, what starts to come forth, just as a drawing, this is nothing more than just a simple formal drawing, uh, is that we start to get these other geometries that were never part of the initial drawing. Okay? So they emerge from just a simple setup. And so once again, we ask, is it possible not to only do this in the digital environment, but how might we uh, start to do this in the architectural build space? It would create, here's another one, this one goes much faster, hold on. So in this case, it's a simple grid, um, but we get these, uh, you know, I was showing this recently at an AIA convention uh, uh, lecture, and they were all drinking beer in the audience um, because there was a table in the back of the room. I think that's how they get people to come to these events. Um, they have donuts and beer. Uh, and uh, this, this one was a little bit tough. Uh, <laughs> so what you see, it's, it's just a simple three-dimensional grid made up of these little prisms, but the, the immensity and density of different axial lines that, that emerge from this a very simple configuration is something that we're interested, interested in, in trying to capture and work with. Okay. Now this rather disgusting thing is called a sea cucumber, and uh, it's an underwater, it's actually not disgusting, it's, it's a phenomenally interesting thing, but it's, uh, it's an underwater, underwater animal. And uh, basically, it's, uh, a number of, of scientists are, are exploring this, this creature because it's capable to alter its physical um, uh, 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 qualities when confronted with, with a predator. So it doesn't squirt out something or run away, but it actually changes its own physicality. And uh, this, is, this is a rather unique and profound thing. Um, in the book Ecotech, there's one Mark Gary is, is uh, someone that's written an article in there. It refers to a number of scientists that are exploring these, these sea cucumbers in this era of intelligent architecture, right? This, this uh, architecture that we're all very interested in. How can something be responsive? What does reciprocity mean with a user or an environment? And here's something that's, uh, it, that physically does this. So scientists are looking at this. 
if this is possible um, as a simple single cell organism, well, not single cell, but a very simple organism, in our architecture, if we're starting to have uh, literally walls that morph or move, could this little creature teach us something? Now, it's not so far-fetched when you look at uh, some of the work that NASA is doing uh, with some of their, their forward-looking space vehicles, which is what they call them. And in this case, this is a high-altitude airplane that, that has wings that, that employ what's called memory metal. And so this metal changes its actual physical configuration depending on, on um, the, the quotient of heat. So at lower altitudes, when there's more resistance, then uh, uh, the, the wings heat up, they change shape, and they're more efficient. At higher altitudes, they change once again to be more efficient at, at, at in less frictional environments. Now, what's interesting about this and, and where this, what this might have to do with intelligence is that uh, the pilot, who is presumably sitting right in there, is, has nothing to do with the, the, the regulation or the changing of these wings, but they're doing that automatically in response to the environment. This reciprocity that I'm talking about. In a much more down-to-earth way, something that uh, this mutability, something that changes all the time, how we're able to reconfigure something as simple as music. I think it's it's something that we are very very used to with our cell phones, with our electronics, and uh, it's something that that I actually use quite a bit as a challenge as we think and explore architecture. Can we start to acquire some of the qualities that we find in a simple iPod? Another idea that I'd like to put out here would be virtual reciprocity. To take the virtual away from the digital environment, um, because for most of us, that's we think of, of virtual reality, we think of, of the digital environment as basically mimicking <coughs> the real world environment. But of course, virtual, the term virtual is much older than this. And um, it's something that we can actually find in our everyday environment. Here, the virtual applies to something being in effect, if not in reality. Okay. If we were to think about effects, it's something that, that we see all over the place. And here's a perfect example of this, this speed bump. Here's the bump, of course. Here's the word bump. And uh, the font size, when seen from a distance, is all in its, in its proper proportions. But as we all know, um, seen closer up, or more specifically, even from plan view, it's rather elongated, and its anamorphic projection of extension like this allows for the, vir the virtual, the effect of the proper word bump, that allows for us, as, as we're, we're approaching it, to be the most readily legible. Arguably, this painted word bump is another type, is, is a virtual bump as well, in the sense that we see this, the word, prior to seeing the actual bump, the, the concrete urn here. It slows us down. So being as, as, as thin as paint and as smooth as the road, the effect of this word, the symbol in this case, might actually cause the flowing, or the slowing, sorry, more than the actual physical element. Tony, the, the, another sculptor, Tony Smith, uh, was working on this project for a number of years. It's called Moon Dog, and in a way, it's a nice combination of a number of these things that I'm talking about. I stumbled upon it in a gallery in New York. Um, I'd never seen it before. Um, was rather uninterested at first when I ran across it, but the, I ended up spending about half an hour with it trying to figure it out. And this thing, uh, which basically is, is has three legs, a bit of a tripod here, keeps changing as you move your position relative to it. So there's this reciprocating um, difference in space and in time as, as the user, or the, the viewer, or the occupant revolves around it. And I won't spend too much time here because uh, I would drive me crazy, but I could spend probably an hour on these four slides just showing how they never quite line up. But this perfectly straight line here 
when you when you try to figure it out here, you don't. You, it, 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 it's very difficult. Where does this line, this, this accumulated line, this, the alignment of different geometries, that start to 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 set up this? It's once we move a little bit, we cannot we can no longer find this. Now, what's interesting about this also is this economy of means in the sense that it's entirely symmetrical. Back up here. In plan, I don't have an image of that. So it's it's not this anamorph uh, this this it's not a frozen form that's morphing or it has been morphed, but in fact is something very regular. But in gravitational space, the space that we all live in, uh, it's constantly changing, as if as if it were some of these earlier digital animations I was showing. Okay, I'm going to change gears here very quickly. Tim and I have spoken quite a bit about. Um, role design build um, and uh, both in our own experiences and practices and also pedagogically and I'm going to show just a, two small student projects um, the reason they're so or they are so small so I feel like I have to just um, boost my own ego a little bit before I show you some of this other design build stuff because I know what you are doing here in other large buildings I'm going to show some very small ones we've been doing with students but uh, besides practicing early on, I was doing quite a bit of, of, of built work as well as an architect. And one of the projects I was working on was this well-known, you should know this from your history class, the Kaufman House by Richard Neustra in uh, Palm Springs, one of the most famous um, and seminal 20th century modern houses you know, in America. And uh, this was in complete disrepair, so uh, myself and basically two others uh, working under the under Marmo Rads and our architects in Los Angeles. Um, I was out here on the, on the job site reframing this and restructuring it. Now what's interesting about this, and the reason I really pop it in at this point in the lecture, is that this house basically wants to be as straight as a machine. Perfectly plumb, open, horizontal. Um, but in fact, the reality of this is that it's essentially as curved, um, all, not quite, but almost as, as are these chairs, in that uh, it's working with very imperfect material, wood, under very, very hot climate. It's 120 degrees out there in the summer. Um, nothing stays straight. And, uh, based, and then it's also an older house. Here it is today. And essentially, our job working out there was to constantly fool the eye um, and to make alignments that might not be straight but would appear straight. Um, it was, it was a, fact, a, a fascinating exploration of, of um, inexact exactitude. How about that? But we could not just use our plumb and our levels to make this thing perfect because it would look imperfect. So I was constantly navigating or negotiating that territory. Here it is today. Now we used to think that uh, the tour buses driving by had, were coming out to see the house. Um, but of course, most people don't know who Richard Reuter was, or especially Care. Um, but this character here, uh, this is Elton John. This is Barry Manilow. Um, if you don't know who he is, go through some of your parents' CDs or record collections. Um, you may find him. Uh, he's part of an older generation, but a very, very well-known singer. He uh, used to live out of the house. And uh, prior to the, the current clients getting the project and re restoring it, he had been there, um, basically barricading it, uh, keeping out the public. OK, so a couple of student projects. Um, using this thing that we all have, these laser cutters, or in this case, uh, uh, CNC milling machine um, and simple plywood, asking the question, how can we essentially find new performance capabilities in a bottom-up way in sheets of, of eighth-inch plywood? So in terms of performance, what do I mean by that? It's essentially finding qualities of, of capacity that aren't just visual ones or form-based ones, but what are they capable of doing? And in a bottom-up way, instead of designing ahead of time and then making it and cutting it out, we would start to generate just a simple module, cut out a gazillion of these things, and see what they could do. 
Now you can see that, that uh, what happens just with the internal forces um, beyond what the, back, the vacuum bed is able to suck down. And uh, it tells you something that, once again, we all, we all know, this kind of springy quality um, that, that exists in some of these woods. So cutting out a component and then simply exploring possibilities of latching, of pulling together. If we're going to make a curve, how might that, that start to take place? Sort of radii, et cetera, that, are, that have to be discovered. Now you could do this all day long on the computer, but once you were to cut it out, it's a whole different story, right? So this, this backwards way of reverse engineering. And then these kind of emergent formations that would take place emergent in the sense that once we start to discover and explore the capabilities of these components and these configurations and the densities and overlaps, then we start to see um, larger possibilities of form making and structure. Or the springy quality here. <coughs> So these, these horseshoe cutouts that start to be interwoven and kind of very, very springy or structural, in the other case would be. After that, then we went into Maya and other digital processes to, to essentially, now once we knew the, the capabilities of some of these, then we can start to reimagine possible designs for this, which I'm not actually going to, going to go into at this point. And then the last student project that I did with uh, Professor Rabiban and Chakshan Bachai, who teach at UC Berkeley, together we were invited to do a, a course down at, at SIRE in Los Angeles over the summer. And so what we opted to do was use, in effect, the most mundane disposable component we could possibly think of, uh, which was the sandwich tray. And uh, we actually flew down with a stack of those on our laps and um, passed these on to the students. And after a lot of analysis and exploration um, and seeing them as a, a type of component, discovered new ways of linking these things together, stitching them. They're asymmetrical. They're hinged. They have different structural capabilities because of that, that separation. You keep your beans from running into your potatoes, from running into your hamburger or something. Uh, and and the, the, the resultant emergent different capabilities and aspects of that simple tray that we started to discover were really quite incredible. Now we didn't take it to the next level, but um, what one could do would be to use this as a casting membrane, essentially. So you'd start to end up with this asymmetrically loaded um, unit that, that would then, of course, have even more structural capabilities. And here, just seeing how we can, you know, testing. So it's it's uh, it, I we we're rather interested in seeing this work in its digital relationship, digital in terms of a, a a system of individual units, right? Digits, zeros and ones that make so much of what we're doing possible. Um, you know, almost literally. Uh, exporting that into a, a unit way of working, and then starting to find you know, more structural things, uh, given our experiences working with other materials structurally, and finding out what these simple things we're capable of doing. <coughs> and some of the work of the simple sandwich tray was just phenomenal. Now there was an under, underlying, I think less than in all of this, in fact the students were very dismayed when we showed up with the sandwich trays. They wanted something good. Um, something amazing, not a sandwich tray. And uh, it took us a while to tease it out of the project, but you can see what some brain power is capable of turning a sandwich tray into. And I think the lesson is, is that um, given you know, the, the access to whatever is possible in front of us as architects, really I think if we use our simple tools in our minds, the possibilities are rather endless. So there is a type of economy of thinking there, I think. And just so you know, these were all recycled. Okay, now uh, I'll go through some other projects. This was also on the CCA campus. So it wasn't a student project, it was something that they um, commissioned me to do, which, which was to create a listening environment for 
a series of electronic music performances. And uh, this was to be something that was up for about six weeks. And instead of making a space like this with a couple hundred chairs, um, such as what we have here today, re-asking how can we, we create a new environment that is a bit more ambiguous, that causes and allows invention both on the part of the audience and the performers to set up that relationship. So the first thing we did was to create this large hump in the middle of the room. It's about 2,000 square foot of room. Here it is under construction. It was all basically cut out, laid flat. And then set up. Now, what was most interesting about this project was, was asking this question, if, as music has a tendency or sound, has this tendency or the capability of dissipating in the air, is it possible to have architecture do that as well? Um, that lingering physicality, what might that mean for an architecture or a material or, or an environment? And so we happened upon this memory foam, uh, which is something that's used in earplugs and tubes and hospital beds and all this kind of stuff. It's basically an industrial design product. Uh, comes in super pink, and uh, which we resisted terribly to begin with until we realized that's all you get, it's super pink. So we learned to love it. Uh, but this, um, this is, the pictures speak for themselves. You basically make a mark on it, and it's slowly after a number of maybe 15, 20 seconds to a minute, depending on the, the density of the mark, it slowly evaporates. And so the presence, this reciprocating uh, acknowledgement of the users in space, but then this dissipating presence is constantly changing. So whether there's, uh, you get a sense of, of what this person was just doing, this, once again, this lingering moment. There was a way of creating a large environment that, sure, you know, looks great for one or two people, but once you start to have a lot of people in here, we're going to see a really great butt mark here as soon as this guy gets up. And, and so you have this deviant circuit that, that really is, is acknowledging and setting up this relationship, this, this time-based relationship with, with the users that are here, which of course, while they're listening to music, they're massaging the thing the whole time as well. And taking that idea of this, uh, literally this dynamic surface, uh, to this hypothetical project for a parking lot um, and wrapping it with something, something flexible. So we came upon this idea of, of suspended points, points in space that uh, are simple parking lot markers. These are at the SFO airport, keep people with their campers from lopping off the top of their campers as they're driving into uh, closed parking areas. So what we proposed was suspending thousands of them. And basically, you drive in, come around, and drive out. So the section is determined by the automobile and the axis of the automobile. This is the and what we would start to get is that from a distance, um, you get this, this solid, dense covering of orange. And really, the project was to give some identity to this parking lot. Simply that. Not to provide any function, anything more than to to make uh, an, a, a, essentially an urban eyesore into something rather incredible. Now the good thing about this is that you could drive into it. Um, they're all very flexible. And if you think about automobiles, um, they're, they're made for one thing. It's basically being in contact with the road and, and carrying people, of course. But uh, you are never really supposed to be hitting anything, are you? Other cars, buildings, people, certainly. Um, and so, and that, they're rather one-dimensional that way. So uh, we're pretty interested in, in setting up an environment that people, in fact, could back into, since this is what happens in these parking garages anyways. If you look at, at the, the little uh, you know, the, the ticket booths and all that kind of stuff, they're all beat to hell. Uh, so why not take this on as a reality, an architectural programmatic reality of, of what happens there? And these start to become, they, they set up this amazing texture that people would walk through. As you're walking this way, it looks very, very solid, uh, but, but automobiles would have to follow this, but pedestrians could just walk right through it. So this kind of 
solid and transparency inside and outside. And these emergent patterns that start to happen relative to the user or the driver, right? Constantly changing due to parallax. And then asking the question, kind of a continuing a line of research here with smaller scale projects, both built and hypothetical. Um, if those were tethered, could we start to now make that, if the pre previous project was tethered, uh, could we start to make that relationship a bit more esoteric? These are basically, uh, each one of those is a skydiver, so this, this large network that's constantly in flux as it's falling. And asking similar types of questions of a simple section. There's a circle that's been basically manipulated until it's, it's essentially a bunch of, of random oscillations. What would it like to essentially build this, or build this that has the capability of that? So, uh, time we were looking at um, a number of explorations we were doing in the studio with rubber. And, um, I had the opportunity to do an installation at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art uh, as part of an experimental awards exhibition. And so we created this system of very simple, basic components that would have the capability of taking on any number of forms. So it wasn't about this one, or that one, or that one, or that one per se. But it has the, cap the, the, the capacity to be all of those or something else. What would that start to mean? Now we set up an, a, a bunch of um, flexible connectors on posts that are made out of bungee cords, in this case. We're mapping it on the floor. These are all bungee cords that are going down to the floor. Uh, these cables we had to put up because we couldn't drill into the ceiling. There's a piece of metal that comes across here with all the cables. After we got to about here, bringing these down, um, we completely ripped this wall off um, of, of its framing back there. And in fact, at one earlier, an earlier scheme, we were going to have literally thousands of bungee cords going from floor to ceiling that people would, would walk through. It was a slightly different premise of a project. But uh, that, that subtle loading that each one has, you do that hundreds of thousands of times, um, we did the structural engineering and we just completely ripped up the museum floor. So uh, that was no longer a possibility. We thought we'd be completely safe with this one, uh, but we actually completely ripped this off uh, and, and kept with a whole lot of structural uh, band-aids that had to be created. So these are the rubber connectors. These are acrylic laser cut panels. Very, very simple um, set of components here that are starting to be woven together. and. What we end up with is this very lightweight configuration in space that's, that the whole thing is flexible and bungee-like. Right? So, uh, of course, it, it, we had to, to give it one configuration, but it has the possibility of flexing into any number. This is really a, a, an experiment. It was, it was, there's, nothing, uh, there's no programmatic function here. Uh, but, but as we start to see the capabilities that this thing would have, Okay, now, a lot of the initial images that I showed, some aspect of whether it was a drawing or an element was fixed and the user was moving through space, right? The automobile is approaching this bump sign, or the camera is flying through this, this component of, of, of the grid of, of squares or circles. What happens? How do we start to, to continue to discuss some of these things if we're working with really the case of architecture, which most of it is rather fixed. There's that old saying, if, it's, if it moves, it'll break. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that. So um, this is a small project on the campus at CCA. Basically, this is a gallery in here, and they needed a new facade. And the question was, how could there be a simultaneous facade that, uh, when seen from the side, would have a curve, and would seem, when seen from up front, would, would be something else? So this duality. 
But we could not also afford to build a three-dimensionally complex form. We have a very, very limited budget on this very small project. So could we imply a form? Could there be, in a sense, the effect of a three-dimensional form? So using a system of fins, when seen from the side, you get this curve, of course, but then when seen from dead on, it completely disappears and evaporates. And then if you walk past it, it comes back, it emerges. So using a system of, of metal bending components, here you see it from the outside constructed. And as one approaches, it starts to open up. And so seen from head on, that curve, which we saw two images ago, is completely gone. So there's almost this animate quality of, of that which is fixed. Okay, for a competition um, in Sonoma for a, a small museum, this is the uh, 101 freeway corridor, very, very heavily trafficked commuter route, both with rush hour traffic and high speed traffic, depending on the time of day. Existing buildings here, this is our new face to the freeway. And essentially, how can we set up a relationship to that freeway, acknowledging the fact that all these cars are going past, screaming by. So here's my assistant out there holding up simple cards, um, and we're essentially just gazing, or um, I'm standing here gazing towards the freeway. We're determining the, the, the space needed to only see the carcasses of the, the cars that are passing by, not the, not the windows, not necessarily the tires. So we could just get this pulse of moving colored bodies. And by setting that dimension that moves entirely across underneath the building, it would set up. And so you'd have this pulse of automobiles passing through. And then starting to work, uh, the second idea that's, that's in here is starting to work with a surface that would be on the front of this, the, the, the skin of the building that when seen from different points of view would either be closed, just as the, the previous project I just showed, that curve, or would open up to reveal. So what we get is, as one is driving up north, just because of the view and the, the setup of the skin here, you can look in and see essentially a curated wall along the building and a window that emerges. But as one drives, either rapidly or just inching along, that window entirely disappears and a new, a new one emerges. And the same as you continue. That's gone and something else happens. So there's this, this ongoing relationship between the building and those that are driving these automobiles. And I think, um, especially since this could be a curated surface, um, really people are just inching along this thing. It's a very, very long building. So this, this relationship between the car as the building is changing in time and in space is something that we're in exploration of. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through this one. I'm going to pass her by. Okay. A project in San Francisco uh, that's just been recently completed uh, was for a, a renovation or an addition to this house here. San Francisco right now is almost an impossible place to build um, because of the, the planning codes and most of the city residentially, if it's over 50 years old, is starting to become historically significant. It's very difficult for architects to um, do much there. So, we, and we ran into that same issue. So we realized we could build a, an internal surface that might start to deform the, the sense of space inside of this place without literally being able to do it structurally, because again, of the, the planning codes. I'll explain what I mean. The client, uh, who has a high-powered job at Apple Computer, has full-body tattoos, um, except for his hands and neck, so when he's wearing his suit, you don't know. He um, basically does not have much skin left on his body to be tattooing on, so he's also a collector of art, so came to me and said, you know, 
I need to keep I need to keep expressing and working with creativity and uh, so I'd like to expand my environment my house and uh, I thought that's great but I also know what that means that means that you need a lot of vertical sheetrock walls uh, for his painting collection and as an architect I ask myself okay what do I get to do besides providing the surface? The service, I should say. Um, I realized that what I could do is take over the ceiling because there would be no art hanging on the ceiling. Uh, the, the other interesting thing about this is, as we know, the tattoos, they constantly change on the body, right? Uh, the, the, there's this ideal tattoo that's put on wherever it is, but as you are moving, it's constantly changing and shifting and, and forming. So this idea, could we actually start to do that with some of the surfaces, the appearance of that in this space? So here's an initial ceiling plan. Most of these drawings are going to be geared towards the ceiling plan. We're going to talk about that aspect when we walk through the project. Uh, and one idea was that we could actually start to manipulate some materials on the ceiling in places wherever we thought it would be interesting to do so. But it just seemed rather uninteresting to do this. It seemed pretty planned. It would be possible to have a pattern on the ceiling that would, in effect, realign, have the appearance of realigning as you moved around the space. So this kind of grid, it would appear as digitally, of course, actually morphing in different places. But we asked the question, could, could a pattern have the appearance of doing that, this virtual morph, as one navigates the space? So we went through a whole series of of pattern explorations, and uh, upon this random pattern that has is a bit geometric head on, but as you start to look at it skewed, it starts to have these these formations that are simply the emergent accumulation of random lines. So if you look back here, it might be hard to see on the images there, but I mean, you get this you get this sense of, of warping. So after a, a, a large set of studies at full scale, and then coming up with a system, here it is. This is a set of drawings. And then here it is uh, in place. Um, I always, uh, this, this was a drawing that um, one of the people in my studio was finishing up while I was leaving town. And he said, sure, no problem, I'll take care of it. Uh, and I came back and here he was. He's great. I quite like him. Okay, and then asking these questions, how do we start to resolve the details at skylights and windows and whatnot? So here's an actual uh, working drawing plan. Same here. Here it has been cut out. And so we worked with Andre Karadak of Studio Sum. Uh, do a lot of the, this is all CNC milled out of simple, um, lightweight MDF. It's almost unmaterial. In fact, we painted it at the end. And um, uh, so this, like some of the previous work, was so heavily invested in the materi materiality of the work that we, we were doing. This was trying to find something very economical that could be cut out, individual panels, all labeled, and basically install them. And we get these amazing, the pattern now starts to take over the actuality. Right? So here's the actual corner, of course. But the thing that one really sees when, when in space is you see this line that basically starts to now subvert the existence of that corner and it starts to actually disappear. This is it installed prior to painting. and then here it is, the ceiling installed. Now it's very difficult to capture images of this, uh, mostly because it's all white. Um, white on white is a very difficult thing to photograph, but um, one needs to sort of be in different places in the space, and, and as you start to, to spend time in there and peer up into the ceiling, you do get these random accumulations that are constantly changing depending on where you are. So it's this reciprocating, almost responsive pattern. Um, wherever you are standing in that, in that environment, and you start to discover new possibilities, new deformations. And then the way that we handle a lot of these, these details, um, wherever it comes here, it's just a tangent, and then just 
a groove cut, just like you would texture map. And then some of these, this groove that comes down here, turns there, disappears, comes back. And so here you see some of these corner details once again. This next project was for a competition in San Francisco, right, on this very small sliver of land for some multi-family housing on the Octavia Boulevard competition here. And it's a place that's both small-scale construction, older Edwardian and Victorian houses, meets large-scale. But uh, the, the, really, it's in a small-scale neighborhood. So the challenge here, how do we start to maximize uh, the land values and basically the volumes that's allowed for by code and at the same time address some of the small scale neighborhood um, textures? Okay. So I'm going to jump very quickly, very, very quickly um, through some of this planning guidelines that the city puts out and disruptive, big box, disruptive, disruptive, disruptive. Um, you kind of get the message very clearly, um, and uh, we could have a much longer discussion about this, where, where essentially modernism in the box meets uh, vernacular and other styles, and what this has to do with the urban environment. But the point being here is that there's literally this code book that comes out that tells you what is disruptive. I like that idea of saying, well, how could we flip this on its head and use disruptive as a way of blending into the negative? instead of walking away from this. Is it possible to find a methodology that actually invites something that's disruptive? And we might be able to argue that it's actually a better way of conforming to the neighborhood. <coughs> disruptive. The second agenda that I had, this is a page that they give you of possible successful scenarios of blending into the neighborhood here. And a bit ironically, I like the idea of what if we were literally to try to just build this, meaning a white thing that's completely blank. And when they don't like it, I can point to them in the book and just say, this is what you call good. And I understand all the arguments are very complex. You know, um, I'm being intelligently critical here. Um, not only to make fun of it, but there's a difficulty, there's a big challenge of how we keep the urban design vitality moving forward in some of our cities. Now, so what we could do is turn to some of our friends um, in the animal kingdom uh, as a possible scenario. And cows and others use uh, what's called, known as DPS, or disruptive patterning system camouflage. So now we have this, this idea of this disruption back as a possibility. And essentially what uh, this camouflage does is it does not attempt to blend into the environment here, but rather uh, to break a very large mass visibly into smaller, um, undiscernible configurations of nothingness, basically. Right? It's these odd blobs of colors, of forms. Okay? So it works in, in shade and shadow, but also it works um, outside. Uh, when, when they're not in it, because it basically takes something that has a recognizable uh, profile and, and breaks that up. Now that's, very, that's, that's in contrast to um, the typical form of camouflage that we know today, uh, which is used to essentially blend in. So, so it's, it's very different, and in fact, um, it, during World War I, this was something, this DPS, or disruptive patterning system, was explored rather uh, uh, in-depthly so prior to the use of radar. And people were using, were using visual cues as a form of camouflage or to disrupt recognition of the shape. So uh, most of the images that we have here today are in black and white because color photography was not invented then, but there are paintings. And uh, we see the types of colors that are being used. And so similarly to the cows, uh, this is to take a, a recognizable mass and basically break it up into unrecognizable, unrecognizable components. 
So what's interesting here is that it starts to also work a bit psychologically as well, in the sense that, or, or let me not psych, let me say perceptually, in the sense that as one is scanning for this, this form, this recognizable form of, of a large ship or an airplane, it's easy for the brain to actually not even see this. Because the brain is looking for this profile. It sees this. And if you're doing this all day long, it actually can escape the cognition altogether. So it, it, it's almost like it doesn't even exist. I mean, this is, this is like, you know, let's paint, paint it bright red and call it camouflage and put it out there in the ocean. I mean, it's crazy stuff. It's really interesting. Um, or once again, confounding, which, which is a, a lot of this had to do with the directional uh, positioning of the ship. Where is its bow? You know, which way is it going? So, uh, could we start to, to explore this architecturally, or else would this be heading? We have a very, very thin site here, very thin, 15 feet wide, uh, that's given. Um, it's an existing site, but we can build up to about 50 feet and get uh, a lot of uh, units in. So we looked at the existing condition in the neighborhood, this kind of texture of uh, configurations of openings. Through a series of diagrams, I won't go too much into this, basically connecting some of that texture with some of the new um, approved uh, buildings that basically use a, a much cruder uh, uh, set of conditions to fit into the neighborhood. Uh, this is our building here. This is the frame, it's a monocar frame. So here's our all white building. Um, knowing that it's in a part of the city that uh, has a lot of fog, has a lot of white skies, and uh, there, there, there is a context here which has been shown on this diagram. Um, so of course it's red against that, but, it, but here's our basically our blank slate. It's neutral. Now what we did to um, use this patterning system is that we used what's called elect electrochromic glass. Uh, basically um, with, with the use of electricity, and turn from translucent to transparent. And we know as, as when glass becomes transparent through the light differential between inside and outside, we get very dark patterning. And when it's translucent, because of the reflectivity and because of the colors that we look, we're looking at from the glass in the frame, you get this, this sameness. So here we could maximize, which is also very important to us, it's difficult about planning in San Francisco right now, we need to maximize allowable building, buildable volume for, for dwellings. So, but we could break it up. There's a bunch of these, so bear with me. Bear with me. <laughs> but we could constantly, this would be changing throughout the day if, as people are living and opening and closing, turning on their glass, turning it off, privacy, light, sunshade. So this isn't pre-programmed. These are, these are like one floor, two, three, four, although the floors were all kind of scrambled to ensure that as, as somebody is, is home and they're, they're turning on and off their windows, so to speak, you get maximum variation of this, this electronic camouflage. Once again, to visibly break up. And also, quite frankly, to ask questions must we build architecture relative to, um, in, in, in this city or perhaps even others, um, by 1906 guidelines? Um, 100 years old in our city, all these homes that were built after the earthquake. What other strategies might there be? And the same with that night. The last thing on here, if you want to win a competition in San Francisco, though we didn't win, um, one needs to address the bay window. So we put on two little bay windows here um, to appease the jury, um, or we tr so we tried. Um, now what's unique about these bay windows is that um, we went back to also thinking about the history of the bay window. Um, and a lot of it was uh, its definition, being able to push out onto the street to have um, secondary views and to, in many instances, see the bay 
see the water. Uh, where this building is located, there are no bay views. It's not looking at the water at all. So using real-time digital feeds, uh, we basically made this roving, these two, these two windows move along the facade. It's entirely smooth facade. Like a, um, those pool sweeps that move around and clean your pool. Uh, these randomly move slowly. You never know when it's going to show up, but it will show up. And you will have a real bay view because it's a real time digital feed. Um, uh, on, onto the Golden Gate in the water. You just don't know when it's going to come. You don't know when it's going to leave. But it seems everybody's happy. Everybody's real estate value goes up. They all pay with, pay views. Um, it seems like a, uh, a good scenario to take care of that. We never quite figured out um, the operating system, though. I would love to be able to, to do that. But we just said it was suction based. <laughs> uh, it seems to make sense that it'd be you know, some kind of pneumatic suction um, uh, system that would move across the facade. Okay, the last, last project I'm going to show here is something that's in construction currently in Tokyo. And this image is rather critical here. Uh, here's our site. This is, <laughs> this is only a part of Tokyo. This is all built. Okay. It's solid. It might look like dirt from where you are, um, but we're looking basically onto an aerial. And um, it's completely um, built, very, very dense, expansive, huge city. This would be, there's not really a downtown, but the more downtown areas would be considered more over here. Now you can see a little bit closer up. This is our site right here. There's a road here, here, here. And uh, this is a rather unique project that we are doing. We are actually not doing the architecture. Uh, there's a Japanese architect we are working with who is designing a four-story, four-living unit building with uh, two large professional photo studios. So it's a rather large corner building. And they're building it within the family. And uh, so it's the architect's family is developing this. This is their previous house. And what's unique about this is that they actually have some vegetation. They have a yard. Uh, you'll see most of the houses, there's a few, there's one right here. Most of them do not. And it's a rather luxurious and really in many ways excessive use of real estate um, because of the value of real estate there, the, the, the sheer density. And to form, they're feeling the pressure as well. They're, they're demoing this building. They're demoing this amazing landscape. Here it is right here. In fact, this is all torn out, you'll see. And they're maximizing the lot and building much larger uh, leasable uh, set of units on there. Now, as I said, the architect in Tokyo is designing the building. What we've been commissioned to do is essentially clad it in a skin, nothing more. And that skin, uh, is a, is a second skin in the sense that it does not need to provide um, uh, any weatherproofing for the units. So really what it is, is a type of buffer zone for the building and, and is replacing this buffer zone that they used to have here. Because of course here's the building. And they essentially filter through this amazing threshold, separating that incredible urban density I just showed you from the private spaces within. So here they have several meters, that threshold, and now we have 20 centimeters of thickness. The question for us uh, is what could we do with that 20 centimeters that starts to create and establish some of those same characteristics as set up by this, this vegetable environment. Okay, now that house has been demolished, here it is. This is the street, it's all very concrete, uh, very hard um, kind of urban space here. So that's what was so unique about that building previously. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this white stuff here, these, these are the units, and here we are with an initial study model exploring 
the, the capabilities of how we can start to wrap this project. Now, I thought I would show some schemes that we are definitely not doing, our failures, essentially. Um, this first one was a series of, of sliding pixels, metal pixels, so to speak, individual units that could move. And, uh, let's see here. So there would not be one facade design or one skin design, but any number. These are only four, there would be an infinite number, essentially. These could all move, they just slide by, by the use of the hand across these bars. And there is access, these, these, um, the skin basically covers outdoor uh, balcony walkways. So you're right next to that, that surface. So we like this idea, we worked on it for a while. Um, I liked this one, the architect over there liked that one. We love the idea that um, that's, you know, your, your parents would go away for the weekend and you can mess up the facade of the house or something. Um, this basically ongoing changing, very public, right? It's at, the, it's at the, the, the corner of these five streets that come together. Very public building. Here it is. The problem with this is that um, in California we have earthquakes, so I know, you know, to think about that. Nobody remembered to mention um, basically typhoons um, that they confront in Tokyo. Very powerful ones and very regular ones. And though the engineer in Tokyo, in fact, designed this to withstand typhoon loads, um, nevertheless, we decided let's move on. Um, these things would be a bunch of flying razor blades um, under you know, severe wind conditions and certainly not a desirable thing to do. To get the, to get the idea here. Um, but we like this idea of, of, of a bit of the dynamic quality that this has. So how can we start to achieve that in less literal ways, quite frankly? It's very literal over here. Uh, so once again, looking, spending time in bushes um, with my camera, um, going to the neighbor's bushes, <laughs> and uh, looking at that, that changing solid and void relationship between leaves and branches and, and you know, the sky. And it's always changing, isn't it? constantly different. And that's what that, that environment was like when it was, you know, again, that, that vegetable screen that was cloaking that other building. So doing a whole series of skin studies, of double skin studies, um, where skin can become structure, skin becomes space, skin is constantly changing. But what we noticed, which was great, was with a double skin and a double loading of the skin, that we would get ongoing you know, emerging opening and openings and closings to so simple parallax relationships as people are, are walking through the spaces and are in those spaces and are approaching it in, in any number of ways. But what's this interesting about this animation, it looks rather dimensional, but it's also, it's very flat, isn't it? I mean, it's just, it's just white on top of white. Um, it's not until you get to the very end that you actually realize it's two planes passing by each other. Um, and so we realized that we could start to deploy a bit of what I've been talking about this evening, both virtual effects for the appearances of density and actual density, the actual layering of the two. I'll explain that. Another scheme that we looked at that we decided not to go to go with because of the literalness was essentially finding ways of warping that skin so it had the appearances of deformation, of thickness, of depth. But it's, it, it seemed awfully um, legible. Now you could read, you could read what the architects were up to. And we were looking something for something a bit that had a high degree of variation. It was illegible in terms of the systems behind it. So there was a complexity there, an embedded complexity. But we liked this quality of solid void from the inside. So what we were able to do, and this is when I, I brought in another architect named Sean Alquist. Um, and his company called Process2, uh, which is in San Francisco. Uh, I brought him in to start working with a lot of parametric modeling techniques, um, both in, um, uh, uh, well, primarily towards the end, we're using what's called generative components. Uh, do you, are you working with that here, uh, It's basically a way of, of doing very complex configurations, but being able to be in control numerically of all of that information so you can start to change and alter it to be in command of that information. So what we did was we created a series of, of irregular 
uh, grids of a triangular grid and, and put voids and cre created skin A, essentially, and then did that again and overlaid them and collapsed them. And so that you see what you see are essentially here are two different surfaces, but now they've been collapsed into one drawing. And that became one skin. So you get this, let me explain it on these drawings. So we start with that, we put in the voids. We do it again, so the, the dark yellow and the bright yellow, and then we collapse them. And so you have this appearance of density, of depth, but in fact, this is one layer. These are all going to be cut out of, out of uh, aluminum. And then we do that again, and these are some of the earlier schemes. We do that on the outside and on the inside, all different patterns that are, in a sense, in a, that are essentially being they're reacting to the different programmatic requirements that we have as we're designing this. And then with these generative components, we can start to say, well, we don't like this pattern exactly. It's too thin, it's too thick. There are problems, there's issues, there's too much density, we need openings and places for egress, we need more light, etc. And now we have this very amorphous system that we can start to actually work with the structural engineers, with the um, digital cutting capabilities, etc. We can start to alter and move this thing around. So these are some of the configurations of starting to explore. These are some of the later versions of it where the, the kinks have been smoothed out, and this is where it stands today. I don't know if you can see, let's see. Can you see these lines here? These very, very faint lines. This whole thing, we're working with a company called Asahi Glass, even though there's no glass in our project here. Um, it's all metal, but they've been doing a lot of work in Tokyo with um, Toyo Ito and uh, Sejima, Toshi Abe, and a number of well-known architects over there. And we have them on board with this project. And the first thing they asked us is, would you like this to float? And of course, we said yes. Um, one very difficult thing about this is its structural, what keeps it in place, what holds that structural. <laughs> so what they came up with was this system of very, 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 just three millimeter thin cables that are about uh, 300 millimeters apart, 30 centimeters. And uh, they're just like piano, you hardly even see these things. And uh, they are loaded top and bottom and on springs. I think there's a detail coming up. So this whole thing, this whole metal skin, which is all interconnected, is also suspended by this very, very lightweight mesh of cables. So you get the sense from the inside, it's constantly changing, shifting. Um, just, we hope, not trying to look like that previous vegetable screen. I'm not so interested in that, but have the qualities of that. This, this changing light and pattern. There you can see the cables. Some of the details that they're, they're working on. So these things are on springs. So in fact, because of the, those cables are always in spring to tension. Uh, oddly enough, like those bungee cord project I did several years ago at the, the museum. Uh, so that it's constantly adjusting to, to um, temperature differentials and different wind loads. Here we are exploring different joint possibilities. All of these pieces, it's going to be crazy. But I like that kind of thing. It's going to be madness. Each of these voids, they're, they're rather large. And so there's hundreds and hundreds of these unique pieces that are being cut out and then um, put back together on site linked back together like a puzzle piece. So you don't see any regular joints. All the joints will show up in irregular places. So you will never see like a four by eight grid or a one meter by two meter grid or something. This is where it stands today. I think this is the last image, maybe there's one more. Where these are the files that we've created. They're all compressed on top of each other. Um, this is how what we're working on later it comes and gets trimmed digitally and then goes off to the company that then basically does all the shop drawings for this in Japan. 
And here's the building under construction as it stands today. So we'll be wrapping this entire facade here. It comes a little bit further out, it goes down there, and then budget permits along the fence. Now, the last thing I'll say, it's, it's, it's very interesting here, is that I keep asking my clients over there, are you sure we can do this? Meaning, what will the neighbors say? What will the government agency say? And it's a very interesting situation in Tokyo right now. More or less, each plot is its own world. And as long as you do a good job of whatever you're doing, you meet codes, you know, you do the right thing relative to that, um, then it, it's, it's, you know, it's a very open-minded, uh, urban context there. Um, also, with, with respect to how long can buildings last, so it frees up that, that, that possibility of trying to do some of this work over here that we'd never be able to do where I'm from in San Francisco. Okay, I'm going to end on that. Um, thank you. And I think If anyone, maybe we can continue down at the reception. If people have questions for Tom, we'll, we'll uh, meet down outside the series. Thanks for coming.